Thank you, Ken. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here today to the 36th Annual uh, Operational Excellence Partners in Business Seminar. As Ken said, I'm Douglas Anderson, Dean of the John M. Huntsman School of Business, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today. Partners in Business was established in 1970 by Dr. Vernon Bueller, whose vision for a land-grant institution, which, of course, Utah State University is, included the opportunity to engage uh, business people, uh, outstanding thought leaders and students in seminars on latest uh, issues in business management, finance, uh, and commerce. I remember as an undergraduate here at Utah State University in 1971, for example, attending uh, a Partners in Business conference and hearing from John Ehrlichman, who was at that time uh, President Nixon's chief domestic policy advisor, uh, and who was at that moment at the height of his power uh, in Washington, D.C. We've had numerous outstanding uh, speakers over the years at this conference, Milton Friedman, Edwards Deming, Lee Iacocca, Alan Greenspan, just to name a few, and today, Roger Martin, who is a good friend of mine and an outstanding thought leader. In fact, Roger is rapidly emerging as one of the most important original and fresh thinkers in the areas of business and education uh, uh, in North America and, and, and indeed the world. Business Week magazine has referred to Roger as one of the 10 most influential business professors in the world. Since 1998, Roger has been Dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto. He is a graduate of Harvard College and of Harvard Business School uh, and was one of the founders of Monitor Company, one of the world's leading strategy consulting firms. For a, a number of years, he led their consulting practice, indeed their company. He is the author or co-author of five books and another one in, pr in, uh, in progress, including The Opposable Mind and The Design of Business. He's also a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review. I think he's written 10 articles for the Harvard Business Review uh, and a regular blogger for HBR. He has a twice-weekly blog there. He served on the board of Thomson Reuters and Research in Motion Corporation, among others. You've just turned off uh, the BlackBerry that he uh, oversees. Uh, uh, and um, he is also, I would say, a great practitioner of both operational excellence and strategic excellence. For 20 years as a consultant, for example, he worked closely with Procter's and Gamble's to help them fashion the success that they've been enjoying recently. Uh, and now, as Dean of the Rotman School, he's doing much the same. He said yesterday in a, in a seminar with our faculty that he is uh, both committed to radical change, but also patient change. Uh, his uh, intention is that when he steps down as Dean, uh, there won't be anything that's recognizable about the institution from the day when he took it over, but during that time, uh, it's also his intention that no one sort of jumps out the window because they get so terribly scared at the pace of change. Uh, at a personal level, uh, I'm really pleased to, re uh, to introduce Roger because he's a personal friend. We first met 30 years ago at Harvard Business School when I had the honor of being his teacher and he my student. And today, uh, and for quite a number of years now, the tables are turned. I'm his student. Please welcome Roger Martin. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I mean, it, it is a great honor uh, to be invited here to, to speak and a great, uh, great privilege to be invited by Dean Anderson, who taught me so ably and patiently when I was, uh, when I was but, a, uh, but a pup. Um, I, I'd also uh, like to thank my uh, student guides. I've had wonderful student guides. Yesterday was Chance, uh, but he is, he is now writing two exams today, and so today it is, it is Pam. Uh, thank you. You've been uh, you've been wonderful in in, uh, in showing me around, and I probably I, I probably you always have to be careful at making generalizations of this sort. But I feel uh, uh, great warmth being here uh, in a uh, in a uh, uh, an important uh, Mormon area. I am not a Mormon, uh, but I'm a Mennonite, uh, uh, and uh, uh, all my uh, dealings. In fact, I'm a Red Mennonite back many, many generations on all sides. And, uh, you know, again, one shouldn't generalize too much, but I've always felt a great sense of colleagueship and camaraderie with my, with my friends like, uh, like Doug and college classmates, college uh, uh, teammates. I think we stand for uh, very much.
much, very much the same, uh, the same thing. So I, 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 I've had a wonderful day uh, yesterday talking to uh, Doug and his, and his faculty members and, and a wonderful warm, warm uh, feeling. So I'm very pleased to be here, very pleased to be here. Now the, the thing that I thought uh, would make sense to talk about in the context of this conference, and I hope it uh, links with what's going on in the rest of the conference, is innovation. And in particular, uh, some of the challenges I see in companies being as innovative as they want to be. It's rare that I meet an audience uh, that, uh, that is very satisfied with how much innovation they do and the progress of innovation uh, that they make in their, in their company. Um, and when I, when I took to studying this and working, working on it, one of the questions I asked myself was, are all these companies and organizations that say, gosh, I wish we were more innovative than we currently are, just being disingenuous, right? Which is that they, that they say they'd like to be in innovative but actually don't spend much time or resources uh, on being innovative. And so they're just talking about it. But as I studied the more, I see no, they actually spend time and money on, on innovation, CEOs make it a, a stated priority and the like, and they still tend to be uh, disappointed with how much uh, uh, at a pace uh, they, can, they can make on their innovation. Um, so, so I said, well, we have, to, we have to figure out why that would be. If people are actually trying to do something, they're not being as innovative as they could be. Um, and and I, I think there are answers, uh, and the answers lie, I believe, in the way we think and process knowledge. And there are a few little traps uh, that I think uh, happen in companies that stem from the way we think and what we pay attention to that get in the way of innovation that I think are, are not all that difficult to overcome. It, but it's, they're hard to overcome if we don't understand these, these, uh, these little traps. And the, uh, a, the core of this, just to summarize it very quickly, then I'll go into uh, the details on it and then, uh, then I will end in time to, to have a nice discussion about it, I hope. Um, which is that there are a couple of fundamental kind of thinking, kinds of thinking that go on in our heads, in, in the heads of organizations that aren't very compatible with one another. And if we don't recognize the, the, the sorts of thinking, these two fundamentally different sorts of thinking, um, we can err in organizations to one side or the other, and that gets in the way of productive innovation. So what are these two forms of thinking? to start off with. One is analytical thinking. Now, analytical thinking, I would argue, is increasingly the dominant form of thinking that's accepted in, in uh, business. What analytical thinking is, is the application of the two forms of logic that we tend to teach in our institutions of higher learning, uh, inductive and deductive logic. So deductive logic, having a general, uh, general rule and saying, uh, 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 based on this general rule, I can demonstrate the following to be true or false, uh, or inductive uh, uh, logic. That is observing the world and formulating a rule from, from that. Right? So uh, if, if, if you think about uh, the question of uh, you know, some market research, we're gonna go and, we're gonna go and ask 10,000 people uh, what they think and come to a conclusion on the basis of that. Right? That would be inductive uh, logic, and you'll see lots of that going on in, in companies. Increasingly, we become more scientific and say, in order to be able to, to understand something, we need to go and, and do lots of research uh, on it. But also deductive, having, having, having a rule that says, uh, in our corporation, we know the rule is, if we increase market share, profits will follow. <coughs> and so if our market share is increasing, we know profits will will follow. We know that from a, uh, from a deductive uh, uh, rule. Now, that kind of thinking is good. It's fantastic. Uh, it's the, it's uh, uh, the kind of thinking that, that uh, organizations have uh, uh, em embraced to be more scientific. But its purpose, we have to understand. Its purpose is to attempt to demonstrate a proposition to be true or false. That's what this form of logic uh, is for. It's called declarative logic. It's to demonstrate that something is, is uh, true or false. Um, and it is designed to produce reliability, kind of a consistent, replicable outcome. So we analyze the past to be able to declare something to be true or not so that we can be highly reliable and consistent. 
So if you think about uh, something that's reliable, think about the Stanford Binet IQ test, the, the, uh, the most commonly used IQ test in the world. Uh, all of you have probably multiple times actually taken it, whether you know it or, or, or not, often as a, as a uh, person in elementary uh, school. And what that does is produce a reliable output. It produces that uh, so that if you take the, uh, that, that test 10 times in your life, you'll get, you'll get virtually the same score every, every uh, one of those times. <coughs> so it's consistent, replicable uh, outcome. How do you do that? How do you produce reliability? The answer is that you produce reliability by narrowing the range of things you look at to only those things that are quantifiable and don't require any judgment to measure. That will get you reliability. So how do we measure intelligence? We measure it on the basis of how you can answer little logical puzzles, right, essentially, that have one of five answers, A, B, C, D, or E, right, so that they're, and one of those answers is right, and the other four are wrong, and so we actually don't even need a person to judge how intelligent you are. In my ancient day, we just marked the cards with, uh, with, with pencil and fed it through a computer and outspat out uh, your answer. That's a perfectly reliable uh, uh, system. It's based on the, uh, on the best of analytical thinking. So what's the problem with that? What's the challenge with that? The problem is that we now know, researchers have sort of demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt by now, that your IQ predicts only 30% of anything that we can tell about you in the future, anything, right? The other 70% of what you accomplish, how well you do in school, how well you do in, the, in, the, in your career, how well you do as a parent, 70% right? has nothing to do whatsoever with your IQ or there's no correlation to be, to be found. Now, why would we want to do an IQ test? Do we want to do an IQ test to produce a consistent replicable outcome? No, we think they'd have an IQ test so it tells something about the future, right? And it's not like it does, tells you nothing about it. 30% R squared ain't horrible, but uh, it doesn't exactly tell the whole story. So the other thing that we're interested in in life, other than consistent replicable outcome, is an outcome that we'd actually want. So if you think about it, if you uh, traveled somewhere to, uh, 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 to a country with not great sanitation, food, water, et cetera, and you come back, you're feeling a little bit rotten, you might worry that you might have picked up hepatitis. We take a, a vial of your blood, we separate it into 100 subsamples, we pump it through the same testing process, and it gives you the same answer 100 times. Is that what you want? Right, is that the outcome you want, to have the same answer a hundred times? No, what do you really want to know? Yeah, is it the right answer? Do you have hepatitis or not? Right, you would like a valid answer. Now you'd like it to be reliable too, right? That would be nice if it's reliable. But really, in your heart of hearts, you want to know whether you've got uh, hepatitis. Now the problem with validity, is that you cannot demonstrate it in advance. It will be demonstrated through the unfolding of time. If we watch you for long enough, we'll figure out whether you got hepatitis uh, or not. Now, the way that you get more valid answers right, is by accepting more variables including ones that can't be analyzed numerically, analytically, without judgment and bias. So if we think about, back to intelligence, right, we've got IQ, highly analytical, reliability-oriented, narrow, et cetera, 
along comes Daniel Goleman, writes a very good book on emotional intelligence, says this will predict more of what's going to happen to you in, in the future. And it has to do with things like your empathy for others, your ability to connect with them, all of those things. Right? He's pointing to more validity. We want a more valid test. What's the plus? The plus is arguably it is more valid, valid, and I think a lot more valid. What's the minus? It involves a whole lot of variables that are fussier, that require more judgment to assess, and so it's going to be less reliable than the Stanford Binet IQ test. And in part because it's not as a, not as uh, uh, old. We haven't figured it out yet com uh, completely, though lots of tests are being developed on that. So this is a battle between two fundamental kinds of thinking and goals. Now, the kind of thinking that intuitive, or the kind of logic that intuitive thinking uses is, in addition to inductive and deductive, it uses a third form of logic, a form of logic that was, uh, that was first posited by an American philosopher named Charles Sanders Peirce, um, who, uh, who said, gee, you know what? You can't actually demonstrate that any new idea in the world has ever come about through inductive and deductive logic. Interesting thought. Said, but we also know there are new ideas in the world, so they must come about some way. Right? And what he said was, the way they come about is through a logical leap of the mind or an inference to the best explanation. If you see only one data point and you need to make sense of it, you will make sense of it the best you can by making an inference to the best explanation. You won't use inductive logic because you've got one data point, and last time I checked, you can't get much statistical significance on one data point. And you can't use deductive logic right, because there isn't a rule that accounts for this anomalous thing that you're seeing so that you make an inference to the best explanation, a logical leap of the mind, which he called abductive logic, which I call the logic of what might be. Right? Deductive logic is the logic of what should be happening. The inductive logic is the logic of, of, uh, of what is. And in abductive logic is the logic of what might be. So to produce more validity, we need to use intuitive thinking, which involves abductive logic, which involves judgment, which involves bias, that sacrifices some reliability. To get more reliability, we've got to lop off judgment, lop off bias, lop off variables, and only use data from the past. Because we can demonstrate from the past what we think will happen. Here, we cannot use the past to predict the future. We have to posit what we think will happen in the future. Okay. So these are two very fundamentally different forms of thinking. And when organizations think about innovation, right, what does innovation require? Innovation requires imagining something new that does not now exist. And if, if we insist on utilizing analytical thinking in service of producing that innovation, <coughs> it ain't going to happen. At least that's what uh, Perth says. And I would concur from the work I've done with corporations on innovation. And so it's a subtle thing whenever somebody in an organization says to anything that is said to them in response, prove it. Right? Those are two very magical words. You come up with a new idea and you go to your boss and your boss says, prove it. You can't. Full stop. You can't. 
So if the standard in organizations becomes you have to prove it using inductive or deductive lo of logic or else we won't do it, we won't do anything new. Most bosses simply do not realize that that is the effect of those two magic words. Those are the two deadliest words for innovation on the planet. And what I would argue to innovators is, is if you're gonna be an innovator, you need to reject those, those two words out of hand and tell the other person, explain to the other person that they've just asked you to do something that can't be done with a new idea. New ideas, innovation, can and will, like all things valid, only be proven to be so through the passage of time, through trying it, and sometimes being right and sometimes being, being wrong. So there's this fundamental, I call it fundamental predilection gap in, or, in, in the world of organizations where there is a force for reliability for what a great, a great management scholar named Jim March calls exploitation, exploiting what we're currently doing, doing more of what we're doing, refining and honing what we're doing now with exploring new thoughts or ideas. And those two forces are underpinned by completely different ways of thinking, and those completely different ways of thinking tend to not be recognized. And so the two sides to this equation tend to depress, terrify one another, right? These people are depressed by those people, right? And these people are terrified by those people. Right? And that's one of the reasons why organizationally in the social setting of the organization, you get such a difficult, a difficult uh, time. Now, all of this stands, this predilection gap, I think gets in the way of the, an important thing that happens in, in, in companies and in the world, which is the advancement of knowledge, right? So, the, so if we step back for a minute, I'm gonna come back to what do you do to uh, try to solve this? But to, but to also talk about why this is important for the world, why it's important for organizations. And that's because of the way we understand things in life. It is arguable that everything we now know in life was once a mystery. Right? So it was once a mystery, you know, as to why if I, if I let go of this, what will happen? It will fall down. That was once a mystery, because it was a little bit mystery. Most of the things you drop fall down, right? But feathers fall down really slowly, and leaves. Birds don't fall down. If I let go of a bird, it'll, it'll fly. This was a mystery, right? It was a mystery that we didn't know how to think about it. We didn't know how to even start to think about why that would be the case. Why do most things fall? Some things don't. That's weird, right? Then. An apple famously fell on a smart guy's head. Uh, and we advance knowledge by coming up with a heuristic, a way of conceptualizing what was previously a mystery. And in this case, he comes up with, the smart guy comes up with the notion that there's a universal force called gravity that pushes everything down, right? Now what's different about that than the mystery? What's different is when something's a mystery, we don't even know how to think about it. It could be any number of reasons why the things we see happen, happen. Once we get to a heuristic, it's, well, here's what's going on uh, here. This happens with many diseases, right? I talk in the, in the, in the design of business about autism. It's terrifically, terribly hard and difficult uh, uh, condition autism uh, spectrum disorder. We don't, we don't even know what to think about. Is that, is that about parenting? Is that about aluminum foil? Is that about, is that about uh, um, uh, vaccinations? Is it genetic? We have to think about all those things because we don't even know how to think about it. Until as, as in the case, as I document in the book, we have a, we have a, 
a, a medical researcher that comes up with the notion that, you know what, in, uh, in uh, people with autistic spectrum disorder, we see copy number variations in their gene uh, sequence. And, and so you start to think, ah, now we can tone it down to thinking about these things. Right? Not everything, we can think about these things. What does that do for us? Why do we care about that? It makes us more efficient. A heuristic is more efficient than a mystery. Rather than having to think about everything, we can think about these things and only these things and can research more into those things, for, for, for example. So Stephen Shear, the doctor I talked about in the, in the book, can be more efficient than other autism spectrum disorder uh, uh, researchers by saying, I'm going to hold in on this and not pay attention to other things. So this is one of the counterintuitive things about knowledge. It is arguable that our knowledge advances in life only as we leave more things out. We have little knowledge when everything's included and have more knowledge when fewer things are included. So rather than the metaphor where we build up our knowledge over time, I actu actually believe that we remo remove extraneous stuff and have littler, littler knowledge uh, kind of a bit more powerful over time. Does it just stay there as a, as a heuristic, a way of thinking about it? No, in due course, some of the things in life uh, become algorithms. We get to the point of having enough knowledge that we say there's no judgment involved. Here there's still judgment. Here it's just a formula. So in due course, we figured out that if I drop, it drops at 9 0.8 meters per second squared if you're anywhere from about America, but 32 feet per second squared if you're in America. We have special rules here. Um, and, it's, and it's now an algorithm. We only need to know the specific variables, how high is it, to know how long it'll take to get there, right? And how fast it'll be moving when it gets there. It's all an algorithm. You don't have to think about anything but that. That'll do. That'll do the trick. Right? What, the, what happens that makes us mechanically efficient? Right? For this, you need lower cost labor. You need less time. You can just do it. And in fact, in the modern world, what is the payoff to getting something to the stage of an algorithm? Computer can do it. So the actual variable cost shrinks to just about zero. That's why life on the planet changed dramatically in the latter half of the 20th century. The payoff to an algorithm was, uh, suddenly has gotten super high. This is why the software industry is not an industry like other industries. It's not like specialty chemicals or, or automotive. It's not. It's the resting place for all knowledge. The final resting place for all knowledge in the modern world is software because it's massively, massively efficient. This gets, this gets converted into a, a series of ones and zeros and gets uh, fed through a machine. There is no judgment, uh, there is no uh, bias, there is no time, nothing, uh, nothing left. So the advancement of knowledge, you can think about it as, at one point we wondered why stuff fell down, then we figured out that there's a thing called gravity, then we figured out that uh, things accelerated at 9.8 uh, uh, meters per second squared. And then uh, engineers at Honeywell figured out how to make a 777 fall out of the sky exactly the way that you want it to fall out so that people land uh, safely and comfortably without any human intervention. Right? Their are el uh, electronic uh, autopilot system. That's all the result of the, of the advance of knowledge through uh, uh, this, uh, this thing wh which I call uh, in the book uh, uh, the knowledge funnel. In business, you can say McDonald Brothers, 1955, California. The mystery is how are Southern Californians going to want to eat in this modern freeway and beach culture that's emerging after World War II. They come up with a heuristic, a quick service restaurant. Right? We're going to get people in and out quickly. We're going to have three at a time milkshake uh, uh, makers. We're gonna have a limited menu and that's, that's what's gonna work. Do they worry about things and, and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna uh, serve them hamburgers, french fries and milkshakes. 
Do they worry about chicken and, and uh, lots of other things? No. Simplified, it's a, it's a heuristic. Makes them what? Way more efficient than their competitors. They open three more restaurants. They got four stores. They're doing great. What happens? Their milkshake maker salesman says, can I buy your chain? Ray Kroc. And what does he do? Turns it into an algorithm. Right? He buys them out and turns it into an algorithm. Turns it into the 57 step process for cooking a hamburger, the process for getting stores, uh, uh, a site located. Everything becomes an algorithm. What does that enable him to do? Is it enables him within 10 years to blank, 10 years, it only took 10 years to blanket America with, with McDonald's. It only took another 10 years to blanket the world with McDonald's. Why did he need extremely sophisticated restaurateurs and chefs that he'd get thousands and thousands of them? No, he had an algorithm. He had an algorithm for hiring, low, you know, relatively low cost labor, giving them a standard package of, of, of training, having the restaurant set up in a complete and consistent pack, uh, way, saying that you cook a hamburger for exactly 37 seconds. Everything was an algorithm and it allowed fantastic scale and size and efficiency. So our knowledge, right, the importance is of this is you get more efficient as you go along. But it's only by leaving more and more out, right? So that when you get to the algorithm, if you metaphorically about those dots, you got a thousand dots up there, you got nine dots down here. All of that, rest of that stuff is left out. So you get ever more efficient, but what about the stuff that's left out? What happens with that stuff if you're not paying attention? Because you tend to not, because you've left it all out to simplify your life. What happens if people start to want to eat stuff that keeps them a tad healthier, that they want to get into their diet something other than fried beef, deep fried potatoes and milk and sugar stirred together? <laughs> Just for variety's sake, right? So you get other people saying, we're gonna stare into the mystery of 1980 or 1990, what people want, want to eat now, and we're gonna do something like Subway, right? and we're gonna do Taco Bell, et cetera. Meanwhile, McDonald's continues to hone and refine that, uh, uh, that algorithm. So what does this mean for a corporation? You can make a lot of money staring into a mystery and turning it into an algorithm. And you can make that for one generation. If you want to be a great company for the long run, you got to do this because if you move knowledge through the knowledge funnel faster than your competitors, you'll have a lower cost uh, structure, you'll be more efficient, you'll be faster, you'll be able to make more money uh, than they will, expand faster than, than they will, and have the resources necessary to do what? Stare in, into the next mystery before they even think it's a mystery and have the money to do it and the resources to do it. Why doesn't that happen all the time? If that happened, what would we know? There would be hardly any new companies that ever get big, right? Because all the existing big companies would have huge advantages over them, huge advantages, right? None of these two people in a garage somewhere should be able to b build a big company, right? But we know the opposite is the case, is that, is that it is the two people in the garage that keep unseating the giants. Why is that? Why is that? I think, I think. It gets, it gets back to the predilection gap, right? It gets back to, it gets back, it gets back to analytical thinking versus, versus intuitive thinking, back to this, right? And companies getting, falling in love with using analytical thinking, which is only capable of honing and refining knowledge in, in, in its existing stage. So you can use analytical thinking to keep on gently honing and refining your, your algorithm. 
here's how we cite stores now. Here are the pat traffic patterns we use. Let's do a little more detailed analysis of traffic patterns to figure out what's the best place to cite stores. Let's do an analysis uh, you know, of, of exactly how to roster restaurants, uh, McDonald's restaurants at noon versus, versus in the evening and in, in the morning and hone and refine that algorithm a little. But to really advance knowledge from a mystery to a heuristic, a heuristic to an algorithm requires, requires intuitive thinking. It requires a focus on, rely, uh, on, uh, on validity. It requires the addition of abductive logic. And it can't be proven in advance. And so what I'd argue is that the big companies of today err to the side of analytical thinking. They squelch intuitive thinking without really knowing they're doing it or having the specific desire. They just say little things like prove it in the, in the boardroom and they squelch innovation completely and leave their self, self prey to the firm that's gonna come along and stare into the mystery that they're ignoring, solve it first, and have the proprietary ability to get down the knowledge funnel faster than the big company that should have the resources to do it. And that's why I say design thinking is the next competitive advantage. To me, design thinking is a way of thinking that combines the best of analytical thinking with the best of intuitive thinking. That says, yes, we have to stare at the past, utilize the inductive and deductive logic to hone and refine whatever knowledge we've got now. Absolutely, we've got to do that. To be reliable as we can be, to exploit what, what is exploitable. But at the same time, we've got to welcome abductive logic. Welcome the desire for validity. Welcome experimentation for things that cannot now be proven because we need to invent the future while exploiting to the extent we can, what we're doing today. And that's the modern corporation, the modern corporation that is going to, I think, survive and prosper. But it's a tricky balance. And as I say, I think with the greater scientific knowledge applied to business, I like to believe we've sort of forgotten, and I think a lot of scientists have forgotten, for, forgotten that there, there is a creative aspect to science as well. I often say that I wonder sometimes about scientists or people who are in love with the scientific method think that hypotheses come by way of immaculate conception. Right? They just sort of show up. And then we do all this number crunching that we love to do so, so well. No, they don't just show up. You gotta kinda think about them. And you've got to honor that step of the process, not just the back end of the scientific method, the, method, the front end of the scientific method as well, the fuzzy front end. And the best companies, I think, are now doing this. Right? Procter & Gamble, I think, is doing this. It transformed itself. It's a completely different company in 2010 than it was in 2000 because it actually, it actually says, we need to do this because they recognized that they were, they were listing to this side as most big corporations uh, do. Right? And everybody loves Apple because, because I think, Implicitly, we know that they're doing this. Now, what I like about Procter & Gamble is that they're trying to institutionalize it across the, uh, the company, and it's unclear how much that's happening at, uh, at Apple, and maybe, but uh, who knows. So, if people, I think, over time, on the basis of their corporate culture, what they've done, what they've gotten good at, what they like then like doing more and more, end up more in this world or more in this world. Well, there's, there's obviously people in the tail of the distribution who are, who are uh, right in the middle. And we have, we have dominant cultures. And what I would argue is we've got a dominant culture in business that tends to be over here and a dominant culture in the world of design that is over here. And so what I have are pieces of advice for people who come from the design side, and I know there's a bunch of people from the, your design school here, here this morning, from the design side, 
who often complain to me, genuinely, right, that they feel like they're designing in hostile territory. Right? I feel like I'm going in there and I'm in hostile territory and I'm taking gunfire every, every day in every way. Uh, and so what, what pieces of advice would I give to them? And just so it's clear to the design people that I'm, uh, that I'm not sort of kind of, kind of holding you entirely responsible, I will then say, what do business people have to do uh, to, uh, to get the benefits of design? So start with the designers, five steps. Number one, take design unfriendliness as a de design challenge. This is the greatest mystery to me as I've studied designers now more and more over the last about uh, nine years, I guess. I've really de delved deeply into this. The biggest mystery for me is why designers, if you give them a challenge of designing something that's in their sphere of what they do, so you got to get you know, a fantastic, you know, like, uh, like uh, when Sony did, you, well, you got to get a, a uh, uh, video camera that fits in the size of my hand comfortably at a time when the, when the, when the, uh, the cartridges, the, the uh, tape cartridges were like this big. What do designers do then? They say, wow, that is a cool challenge. I'm going to get to work right away. I'd like to solve that. So really difficult design challenges gets them excited. But if you say to them, here's your challenge. You're working in the middle of a design unfriendly organization that doesn't appreciate design at all, at all, at all. You've got to figure out a process for working with those people that's so elegant and so wonderful that you'll be able to get your, your design done. And they reject out of hand that as a legitimate design challenge. Here would be my advice to all designers in the room. The most common characteristic I've, I've had the pleasure of, of working you know, closely with, with uh, some of the best designers in this country, you know, David Kelly and Tim Brown and, and uh, Harry West and Sir Rob Bushagi, all of them. All of them have one characteristic that's in common. They do on. And that's what makes them special. They figure out how to design and design on friendly territories. So number one empathize with the design unfriendly elements, right? Most of the time it's like, why are these people going to be such stick in the muds? They're boring, they're, they're not willing to try anything. Remember that they're often responsible for reliability. And what you're doing is going to lower their reliability, if anything, productively because they need some more validity. But if you spend your time judging them rather than empathizing with them, you won't get very far. Speak the language of reliability. Reliability oriented people and, and, and validity oriented people have completely different language systems. Reliability oriented people talk all, a lot about proof, about best demonstrated practice, about consistency, etc., predictability. Can we forecast this? They use all those words, right? Whereas designers use words like, oh wow, and <laughs> this is going to be great. Uh, and you've never seen anything like this before. Uh, fantastic, fantastic, right? They're different, just different languages. Learn to speak the language of reliability and you'll get a lot farther. Use analogies and stories. Okay, so here's the problem is you cannot prove any new idea uh, in advance. Right? So any reliability oriented person is going to be saying to you when you say, you know, we could do this thing that you guys have never done before and we're going to be a huge hit and it's going to make more money than you can, you can shake a stick at, right? The reliability oriented person will be just like, you know, Talk to the hand. I mean, I don't, I don't hear, you know, da, 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 da. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And that all, makes me, that all makes me nervous. But you can get closer. You can say, I know this has never been tried before, but it's a lot like this in this other industry. Here's the ways in which it's similar. So it's not quite as new as you think it is. Right? And they'll say, but it's not exactly the same. And you say, Last time I checked, that's what an analogy is. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be called the same, not an analogy. <laughs> but, I, but I digress. <laughs> Fourth, bite off as little a piece as possible to generate proof. Right? So for a designer interested in validity, right, what is the big problem with the next six months? It's in the future. 
and the reliability oriented person does not count anything that's in the future. They only count things that have been in the, that are in the past that can be analyzed inductively and deductively. Right? So that's the bad news about the next six months. What is the great news about the next six months? In six months, it will be in the past, correct? <laughs> right? Pretty simple. Um, so if you can say to the reliability oriented person, let's just try this. Let's just try this little piece of this, what, we're, what, what I'm proposing, and let's watch it for six months or three months or whatever. And here's what I think is going to happen. And let's check back after six months and see whether it's happened. So you scroll forward six months later, the validity oriented person knocks into the reliability oriented person and says, you know, you know, I said this was gonna happen and look, it's happened. And the reliability oriented person says, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, we're gonna roll this out all over the world, you know, what, what are you talking about? Right? Because it's all now in the past and, and it matters, it counts uh, for them. And so often designers will say, we gotta do the whole thing or nothing at all. And the validity or, or the reliability oriented per person just says, thanks, uh, and next, thank you for playing. Those are, those are the things that if validity oriented design uh, people would do, I think they would have way higher levels of success in getting things to happen. Business, design is hot as a pistol. Business wants to use this design, but business while saying, oh, it wants to use more design is busily saying prove it, et cetera, and squelching it. That's why the great frustration. Here are the five productive steps they can take. Take inattention to reliability as a management challenge. How many managers I say, oh, we brought in the designers and they're all the airy fairy, all this stuff, they can't prove a damn thing and I'm just, I just got rid of all of them uh, because we can't, we can't operate that way, right? That's the easy way to manage, it's not the intelligent way to manage. It's a management challenge just like collecting receivables is a managing uh, management challenge, just like building a new uh, distribution channel while you're keeping the old one alive. They're all management challenges, just treated as yet another legitimate man management challenge. They are not gonna be attentive to reliability. And guess what? If they were, they wouldn't be innovative. So take that on as a challenge. Empathize with them in the same way. You'll notice the parallelism here. Speak the language of validity. Learn to uh, understand their language. You have to understand it as much as them. Don't do what business usually do, does when they invite in designers. Force them to speak your language entirely. How well does that work in international diplomacy? We'd like to solve this border conflict, but please could you speak our language while we're doing it? Good luck. Share data and reasoning, not conclusions. Okay, so here, the point is that you've got lots of past data and past reasoning. Right? The designer would be better off if they had all of that because remember I said design thinking is the combination of inductive and deductive logic with abductive logic. But the data and reasoning that you've had in the past has led you all the way to the conclusion, which is what? What you're doing now. So it's unhelpful to say to that designer, here's all our data and here's all our reasoning and that's why this is the intelligent thing to do. Just drop the last piece because you know what they're gonna do? They're gonna take that data and they're gonna take that reasoning and mix it together with inferences to best explanations of things that don't fit with that data to produce a new answer. They don't need your conclusions con constraining them. But you can help them with your data. You can help them with your, your reasoning. And don't act as if they don't use data and they don't use reasoning when they're making their logical leaps of their mind, their inferences to the best explanation. Again, the very best of them are intensely uh, analytical. They just do different stuff with that analysis. But if as big a piece as possible to give innovation a chance, you need to recognize the same thing. You need to give the innovation a chance to prove itself through the passage of time. And if you say, well, we can, we can, we can spend you know, $357.87 on this market test, you probably will kill it. 
if it really takes a couple hundred thousand or a million dollars or ten million dollars sometimes, whatever, to bite off as big a, ch uh, a piece as you can uh, uh, chew, uh, that, uh, as a, that you can stomach to give innovation a chance. So I, I believe that if, if uh, people who are more reliability oriented, people more in the world of uh, traditional world of business are willing to take those steps, designers are willing to take those steps, we will have a bunch of that going on and we will have bridged those predilection gaps and sped up uh, innovation and made all the spending time, energy on innovation much more productive. And what we will see is more large companies reinventing themselves rather than being one generation companies, which is what we have now, I would argue, is many companies that keep being one generation, one great innovation that they've pushed through the knowledge funnel that they exploit until they die. And I think that's just unfortunate for those companies, for their employees, for their communities, for the world at large. I don't mind little companies coming up, but uh, but uh, I, 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 I hate to see big companies uh, uh, not uh, prospering multiple generations. So those are my thoughts on, on innovation and I'd be happy as long as we've got time to, uh, to take any questions. Oh yes, thank you. simply distilling that down through your funnel to the algorithm of actually producing a car. And we, when we watched the execution of the algorithm, it was a beautiful thing. But Toyota is also in trouble. And I'm wondering how you would, how you would characterize where Toyota is relative to this discussion and the thing that they do so well. Sure, I'd be happy to, although I will state this for, for disclosure, <laughs> proper academic disclosure reasons, uh, Akio Toyota asked me to be on his seven member quality panel. So for the last six months, I've been exploring that up, up close and, and, uh, and personal. Uh, and and what, what I'd say without, without betraying any confidence, I, I, I think your, your, your analysis is, is uh, resonates a lot with me. More right than more right than wrong, and I think Toyota has managed to to go from you know obscurity in the fringes of the industry to the largest uh, and most successful player in the in the industry through doing exactly that. The Toyota way, I think, is a march from mystery to uh, heuristic uh, to algorithm, and and I do think the challenge is the challenge that I've posited before, which is which is as you leave stuff out, kind of what are you, you know, what, how are those things uh, hurting you? And, and I think the challenge now is, is leaving out a, shall we say, a, sort of a, a broader appreciation for the human factors around automobile ownership. Uh, so, so understanding and empathizing with customers who experience the vehicle doing something that they don't expect the vehicle to do. Uh, it's, it's about inc incorporating into your process a way of understanding their emotions, their feelings, and what you need to do in that, in that situation. That isn't in the Toyota production system. I mean, it's, it should be part of the Toyota way, but in the core Toyota production system, that's not in it, right? That's something that's the, uh, that's a little outside and, and being able to incorporate that in will make it and drive that through will make it a richer algorithm that'll help Toyota for the next generation and the next generation. But that's I think the, the, the challenge that they have right now. Does that make, make sense? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I'll go there and then I'll go over here if that's okay. I hadn't thought about that before, and I think it's a great thought. <laughs> it would be my reaction. I, yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, I think I think there are in a modern kind of globalizing uh, uh, world uh, that that that's a 
that's a big challenge for uh, a global company. And, uh, and the idea of having uh, uh, translators, you know, I think through the course of time in international diplomacy, translators have been absolutely, absolutely uh, critical. Uh, and uh, I was at, uh, I was at a, a talk that, uh, the, uh, that was given by somebody who acted as Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, translator in the uh, Camp David uh, uh, talk with Sadat, and he admitted <laughs> that he, uh, he, he said, I, I, I took great liberty with the words of both presidents to drive it uh, uh, to, uh, towards uh, uh, something that would, uh, would work, uh, that would work better, and I wasn't completely faithful to every, every word that came out of their mouths, and so I thought, <laughs> That was kind of cool. Now he'd waited like 30 years to admit, admit this. But, uh, but yes. I was No, no, no. I, 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 was, I, I, I agree. Uh, I was just saying, uh, I think the role of the translators, if I just say, the role of translators in other fields where they're known for playing more of a role, I think has been so important that, that analogizing to this and saying that they, they could play a real role here seems, uh, seems, uh, uh, right to me, yeah. So I think it's a, I think it's a very helpful point. Yes, over here. Absolutely. So again, uh, as with the previous point, I think uh, the previous two points, I think you're, you're you're bang on that. That's one of the biggest sort of decisions in some sense any CEO and its board and the board of a company needs to make, which is how much exploration and how much exploitation. How much do we run the current algorithm and utilize our time, energy, resources to run the current one versus explore the uh, uh, the next one? Make sure we keep on looping around. Um, what I would say, however, is the following, that in my experience in working with companies, I, I find that a less, lesser problem than another problem that you might not necessarily expect. And, and it is, it is the, the kind of, what do I even describe it? The, the, the reliabilityization of mystery solving. So that what happens in these big corporations is their labs, they'll be spending hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars in their labs, but in their labs, allowing the sort of the reliability bias to, to creep in so that everybody's trying to prove everything in, a, in, in advance in the corporate R&D labs. And this is where my, another friend of mine, a wonderful designer, Bill Buxton, uh, who you know invented most of the uh, 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 computer animation graphics and car design graphics in the, in the world, uh, sort of bemoans the fact that that uh, he can't find a single software company that has had more than one innovation, <coughs> one substantial innovation that's resulted in a product. All the big software companies of today did one and, and then bought in every every other one, and that's because their own labs get just so conservative and reliable. Uh, and so even though it's in the work of supposedly solving mysteries, they go about it in a way that doesn't get many mysteries solved, so they have to go buy innovations in from the outside. So I think yours is, is right to pay attention to that, but I would focus now more on paying attention of what is the culture, the operating culture of the R&D organizations of big uh, uh, corporations. Uh, and I think there are issues and problems there that, that, uh, that need to be tackled by, by most companies. Not at all. I see a hand over there, and then I saw one over, the, over there. So I'll go there, and then is there one over there? Yes, I'll go there after. 
it every time. You just, just whenever I got to stop. Well, yeah, it's a good, it's a it's a good question, and this is this is something I talk a lot with uh, Patrick Whitney. And I don't know if, if for those of you are in the design field, he's a, the wonderful uh, dean of the uh, Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And and my view is it is that the the world of design and design ed education and, and his too uh, needs to kind of codify those things uh, more. What does it take to be a, des a designer? I'm not one, right? I'm, I'm a recovering uh, management consultant attempting to be a dean. Uh, I'm, and I'm in the 12-step program, uh, <laughs> one day at a time. Uh, but <laughs> um, uh, so what I'll say here is just, just you know, an economist uh, uh, speaking. But for me, a designer is, is uh, somebody who's skilled and experienced in combining abductive logic with inductive and deductive logic. At its very root, that's what they are. If they were an artist, not a designer, what I would say is they're, they're uh, skilled at, at, uh, at abductive logic, full stop, right? And so they're into the production of things that have no, if you will, exploitability what's, whatsoever uh, uh, in, in mind when they're creating what, whatever they're uh, uh, creating. The designer actually is tied tied enough to the business world to say what I what I what I'm making has to work for more than me. It has to work for for uh, an organization, and so this is why I I refer to design thinking and not just design. And some designers don't like that at all because I'm I'm abstracting it out of the skill associated with individual design fields, right? The skill of you know graphic design or the the skill and experience of furniture design where, where there's a sort of a tactile uh, part of it, a making part of it. I'm focusing more on the, the, the thought process. And, uh, and so that's when I call, when I think of designer, I think of somebody who, who can productively combine those forms of, of logic to invent futures that can drive knowledge uh, forward. Time for one more, or one, more, one last question? Yes. Well, I, 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 I think, you know, a, a couple things, uh, right? It's going to be hard for uh, uh, languages to, to be learned by, by each side the farther apart you are. Uh, so I, I really think that, uh, you know, and I'm biased on this, what I'm doing at the Rotman School is saying I want to bring into the Rotman School of Management the best I can bring out of design, the world of design education, and integrate that into business education. And I think at the same time, design school should be doing the same thing, bring the best of management uh, thinking in and, and engaging in the tricky and difficult act of integrating that into management education. So I think one of the things that you've got going for you is, uh, is you have strong management schools and design schools in one university. Often that's not the case, uh, right? You know, one of the things Patrick has to work on is actually building up IIT's business school to, to create a better, a better partner uh, to, uh, to work with. So, uh, so I, I, I think that's kind of uh, a step one in having as many opportunities for the students of those two uh, uh, faculties to work together, uh, the better. Uh, we do most of our work at, at University of Toronto because we've got sort of an architecture faculty and a fine arts faculty in the University of Toronto, but not the kind of design school that you'd have, uh, have here. So we have gone outside to Ontario College of Art and Design, a fine uh, you know, design school, sort of a design school that I think, I'm not entirely positive, but I think would look like your, fa your faculty here uh, in joint venture with them. But it's, it's slightly trickier because it's, it's inter-university uh, uh, rather than intra-university. So more uh, getting together is, is better, I think. I, I'll, I'll happily uh, answer your question uh, during, the, uh, during the break.
but I will turn it over to you, Ken. Thank you very, very much.